What's going on, my Algebra 2 students? Let's get this party started with, um, I'll tell you what we're going to do is some people were having trouble with this Expo 3 Part 5 or whatever it is. It's like 44 points or something like that. And they were getting all messed up, and so I figured I'd help them out. Maybe do one or two example problems. Sound good to you? And then what I want to do... Oh, which one are you guys talking about? Which one do you guys want help with? Is it the one that's due today or the one that's due um, on Wednesday? Or not Wednesday, but uh, on... Yeah. The one that's due today, probably. Yeah. All right, cool. So why don't I just do a few of these for you? Okay, cool. All right, so check this out. These are actually really, really easy, I think. No, they're really easy. All right, um, I think maybe the best thing to do would be to show you my camera screen. Give me a second, my computer froze. Okay, so you're trying it now? All right, let's do it. Let's do it together. Then. Whoa, whoa! Sorry, hold on. I'm gonna have to reload it. My computer froze. What up, dudes? Can you hear my voice? Arg! But this thing's not letting me do the camera. Audio check. Audio check. Good. Video camera check. We good? Up and running? All right, let's do this. Size 18. Bring your computer up there. Let's go get up on the board. My recording. Good, we're recording. Okay, good, cool. Let's do this one. So, let's do that first problem over there. What is it? It's three, seven. What were the numbers? Uh, six, six, zero. Six, six, zero. Right here. And what? Nine, six, six. Nine, six, six. Point three, zero, six. Point three, zero, six. All right. You're going to need to, need to be on calculator and quick style. Cool? All right, so check this out. Um, the general formula that you guys have is f of x is equal to c times a to the x power. And, and what you do is, in order to figure out what a is, you just take the ratio of these two numbers. Got it? Got it? You just take the ratio. You take 966.306 divided by 660. But that's not actually true. Here's where the big complication comes in, right? Is that that's true if these are consecutive numbers. If this is 3 and this is 4. 
or if this is six and this is seven, if they're right after each other. Does that make sense? But the way I've explained it to you in the past is I said, well, here's what's really going on. Three, four, five, six, seven, six, 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 and uh, nine, six, six, you said? Yep. Point three, oh, seven, or something like that? Six. Six, oh, seven? Three, oh, six. Three, oh, six? All right. So what's happening here, yeah, you guys already picked up on this idea here. Is what's happening here is the ratio between here to here, that's that number right there, R. It's this jump right here. But the A value that you're trying to get is the, the number you multiply it to get to the next number. So how do you, how, how many times do you have to multiply it to get to the next number? How many A's do I have to go through in order to make one of these giant jumps? Four. Exactly. Very good. And um, so I know that A to the fourth power is equal to R. Got it? And then what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to solve for A. I'm going to give you guys the, the universal way on how to solve these problems every time. Cool? I want to solve for a, a over here, meaning basically I want to get A all by itself, or maybe more accurately, A to the first power all by itself. Cool? So what do I do to the fourth power to get rid of that fourth power? I take the fourth root. Good. One way to do that is a symbol that looks like that. Of course, you got to take the fourth root to both sides, so you do that. But here's the problem. I like that idea. That's perfectly fine. The problem is you guys don't know how to put that into your calculator. Am I right? What the heck is a fourth root? So another way to write the fourth root, I mean, think about it. Remember I told you that one property that a number or an exponent to an exponent, you multiply those exponents together? And I want to make this exponent over here to be a 1. So what is a number I can multiply 4 by to make it equal to 1? One fourth. Something to the one-fourth power is exactly the same as taking the fourth root of it. And that you know how to plug into your calculator. You just plug in some number with a caret and then your know, parentheses, one divided by four, and then close parentheses. Did you guys catch that? Do you understand what I'm saying here? You know how to make a to the one-fourth power on your calculator. You might not know how to do the fourth root. But it's the same thing. A fourth root means to the one fourth power. So you, yeah, okay, right, right. But you have to do one fourth of both sides. So what happened is, what is four times one fourth? Just, just one. Yeah, one. And that's what we wanted, right? A, A to the one. It's the same as A. So that's kind of the point. That's how we undid the fourth power. And then over here, this R, this R was 966.306 divided by 660. Can you tell me what that number is? Use a calculator, <laughs> obviously. Unless you're that good. 1.1? 1. 1. 1? It is? 1.1? 1. 1. So, this R was 966.306 divided by 660, and that's how you got 1.1, right? Oh, no. No, that's wait. 1.41. Oh, this is 1.41. 1.1 happens after you've taken the fourth root. Yes. Okay, I see. When you do 1.41, caret, and you can do two things, all right? You can put plug into your calculator exactly this, 1.41, caret, parentheses, 0.25, close parentheses. That's what it's going to look like on your calculator. You'll end up getting your answer is 
1.1. Are we cool? All right. So we figured out what A is. Here's, here's, um, Okay, you, to be honest with you, I don't have a calculator on me. Let me go grab one real quick. I don't use calculators. It's 1.46. Oh, That's you, you actually messed up the numbers? I, yeah, I think I messed, messed up. All right. Sorry. I'll tell you what. I'm sorry, you guys. I'm going to have to trust your calculator skills because I don't have mine on me. Um, yeah. Okay, wait. So what is this number? 1.46. 1.46. And then when you take that to the... And you take that to the uh, 0.25. the one or point two five power. What is it? One point one. Yeah, yeah. Bradley, take nine sixty six point three zero six. Divide that by six sixty. Yeah, the ratio is just this number divided by this number. Okay, now, the only thing that I, it, this right here is the general equation. It only has no numbers. It has only variables, okay? The, the only thing that I could really change up on you is where did we get this 4 from? Where would you describe that 4 coming from? Like, without having to draw a picture and say, oh, I multiplied it by A four times, it's this right here. There we go, Bradley. That's exactly it. It's the difference. It's 7 minus 3. Got it? So maybe what I can do is if I wanted to make it look more like a formula, I'll call it A times X2 minus X1 equals R. This isn't a new formula. This really isn't. I don't want you memorizing this or anything. I'm just saying, you know, for general problems, for any problem, you can just say whatever the x value is in the second x value minus the first value, that's what you put in the exponent. You guys get it? All right, cool. So I think that one of the things that I did was I did a different problem where there was like a 0.5 here and a 1 over here. I can't remember what the numbers were over here on this side. I think it was like 3 and 9. 30, 90. Oh, well, 3 and 9 would have done the same thing, but it's 30 and 90. Okay, good. So check this out. What is R? What is my ratio between those two numbers? It's just 3, right? 90 divided by 30 is 3. Bradley, you get that? You understand? All right. Are these consecutive? No, they're not. So I have to play this trick where I say, well, A to the sum power is... Um, a to the sum power is equal to 3. And, and that sum power is 1 half. Right? Because 1 minus 0.5 is 0.5 or 1 half. We cool? All right. How do I, how do I get rid of that 1 half? You square it. Very good.
The reason why I showed you this problem is because for the most part, what we've been doing is we've been taking whatever number goes here and bringing it to the fraction power. You know, like if it's fourth, if it's a four power here, I raise it to the one fourth power, or I take the inverse of that and I raise it to that power. For this one, we're actually doing exactly that. We take a one half and we invert one half and we raise it to that power. What's the inverse of one half? It's just 2, because 1 over 2 flipped over is 2 over 1. So that's why I'm squaring it. And it looks a little bit different, but if I were to write it like this, I don't think any of you would complain about, hey, you got to square both sides to get rid of that square root. You know what I mean? So what is your A value in this case? Your A value is actually 9. Are we cool? All right. The other complication is to figure out what the C value is. And the C value is simply you go F of X is equal to C times 9 to the X power. And then you say, gee, wouldn't it be great if I knew at least one point where this thing actually ended up being a true, you know, uh, and the, a point that's on this graph. And you say, well, I happen to have two points, one and two. Let's choose one of them. In fact, to be honest with you, I'm going to choose this one right here. In fact, I love the way Sophia put it. Let's do 90 equals C times 9 to the 1 power. 9 to the 1 power is 9, so C is equal to 10. Any questions, comments, vomits, etc.? All right, so for this entire homework set, the only complication that I added was that extra bit of stuff that you needed to do to play with that exponent. You can't just take this number and divide by that number and you'll get your A value. Right, this entire section is on non-consecutive integers. That's what it is, that's all I did. Ooh, mess with, mess with your heads. No, not really. In fact, to be honest with you, it's almost like a, it's almost like an easy free points. Um, I, I, I think that I set the margins for a lot of these homework assignments too small. And so a lot of you were complaining to me and saying, hey, why am I getting all these wrong answers? I've been double checking it. You must be wrong. And actually, I've been doing it right. The thing is, I've set the margin so high that you need to get the exact four decimal places that I put in in order to, to agree with me. And I always think that's ridiculous. I didn't like doing that to you guys when I was teaching you guys chemistry. When I teach physics, I give you guys this huge margin of error. So what I need to do is go in and a lot of times I'll just have to go in and fix the, the margin of error. I apologize if it gets messed up. Um, if you guys are doing this this homework set and you guys are like, I'm doing it right and I keep getting the wrong answer, chances are you're doing it right and you should be getting the right answer, but Mr. Daldy is too much of a jerk to give you the guys the right answer. Of course, Mr. Daldy is not too much of a jerk. I just seem that way and I will fix it. Sound good? All right. Let's, let's apply this to our lives because... I keep telling you, what is my favorite question to ask in mathematics? Come on, you guys know this one. You can do you know, why? 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 Why the heck are you teaching this? Why should I care? What is the point? All right. This e or this 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 exponential stuff might be. I don't know if it's complicated. Is it complicated? Has it gotten complicated yet? Not really, okay. Some of the stuff you're gonna be learning in the next week or so is gonna be like, wow, where did that come from? But to be honest with you, this topic is deceivingly useful. And it, it's not even deceivingly useful, it's deceivingly useful in your everyday life. And the reason why I say deceivingly useful is because I didn't realize how um, powerful it was 
until I took higher courses and more and more courses and I realized, oh snap, this stuff shows up all the time. And the one particular place that it shows up in is economics, as Sophia pointed out. <laughs> you know when you put your money inside of the bank, it occurs interest, it inc incurs interest, occurs interest or whatever? Yeah, and it shows up a lot on the SATs as well. But be, because something shows up on the SATs isn't a good motivator for you to learn it. That, that would be like you saying, why should I know, know this? And I say, because I said so. I hate it when people do that. But what, what, what I, I'm, I guess what I'm trying to say is that like this has a lot to do with money. A lot to do with money. And I, I really think that regardless of whatever you go into, you might be interested in how it affects the money that you have or the money that your company has or whatever. So knowing this stuff is actually really important. Cool? All right. To be honest with you, I don't necessarily think there's anything. Um, is there anything relevant or good in Chapter 5, in Expo 5? And my answer is no. No. It's not necessarily that it's not relevant or good. It's that um, there's nothing that's necessarily like... Um, different or new we're just applying it to oh uh lucas I, i'm talking actually about past homeworks as far as um as far as my margins being tough if you find that my margins are tough let me know and you know i guess you know me i will adjust it to be reasonable i hope that you've never experienced a case where mr dodd is like no I want you to write down all the five digits that I wrote down and it has to be exactly the same ones unless of course you're doing chemistry or engineering and it needs to have a certain level of accuracy then I'm a jerk about those kinds of things because if you mess up those that you know you put in the wrong amount of numbers you're gonna blow things up especially you Bradley the reason why I said that is because you want to be an anesthesiologist so you need to know exactly how accurate you need to be and be that accurate or you'll kill people. Okay? No pressure. No pressure. All right. Anyway, I'll tell you what. For Chapter 5, why don't I just do some of your homework for you? Sound good? All right. Chapter 5 is all about... It's still about this form f of x equals c times a to the x power. The only thing is we're going to change up um, we're going to change up certain things. We're going to change up the letters. Okay? Remember when I originally introduced this to you? I introduced this to you as a times r to the x. And I hated that they made the switch. I still, to this day, do not understand why they've chosen these letters. I've now made the switch over to these letters just because, because I don't want to confuse you anymore. But um, all I'm doing is I'm changing the letters a little bit, right? So you might see an equation that looks kind of like this, but we're going to use different letters. Um, is the actual formula y equals a times b to the x? I have no idea, to be honest with you. I thought it was a times uh, r to the x. I, that's what I thought it was. But apparently it's not. Apparently they didn't want to do that. Apparently they wanted to do something stupid like put a over here. Right? And that has nothing to do. This is the gummy bear factor, and we usually call that a. So why not call that a in the first place? I don't know. All right, anyway. Um... You might see it like this. Okay? Don't freak out. <laughs> it's not a new equation. It's the same equation using different letters. Same exact everything. 
why the heck would we change the letters? Okay. Um, well, because we're applying it to a different scheme. Like, for example, if we're applying this to money, we don't measure things in X, a distance. We measure things in time. So wouldn't it make sense to change our variable, the thing that we are allowing to change the increments of, to be a T instead of an X? Cool. And then this, this R over here, that stands for rate, which makes perfect sense, okay? This P over here, so this P and this P naught is different. I don't know if you took chemistry from me, but, but I call this P with a little zero, I call it P naught. It just means the initial P. And what, what that, what that, um, what this is referring to is it's talking about the word principle. Um, and when you invest money, you're investing a principal amount. That's what it's called, I guess. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not very good with money. Um, I don't got much of it. <laughs> so I don't got to do much, uh, much investing. But I'm just saying is that P is your initial investment. So this is the amount of money you get is the initial investment times the rate to the time to the T. Does that make sense? All right, you got to go? Okay. So all I'm doing is I'm changing the letters on you a little bit. All right, let's see. So here's number four on Chapter 5 homework, which is Expo 5 homework. Um, it's talking about the... Yeah, let's do it this way. The principal amount that you have is 500 times 0.8 to the t power. All right, let's answer some questions based off of it. All right, this is talking about some radioactive decay after t amount of years. So I have some kind of radioactive material that I bury in the ground. And radioactive material has a half-life. What a half-life means is it decays away. It actually changes from one isotope to another. Let's say uranium. And so um, the first question is, how many grams of the element did you have initially? Now, Sophia loves to call this the y-intercept. And, and, I, and I keep cringing about that, but actually, Sophia Sophia's absolutely right. It's the y, this is the y-intercept. This number right here is how much you have initially. The reason why I cringe is because um, that's not always true. That That's not always true when it comes to like parabolas and cubic functions and all of that kind of stuff. That A value doesn't give you your y-intercept by any means. But in this particular case, it does. And the reason being is because to find the y-intercept or to find the starting point of something, you plug in t equals zero. If I plug in t equals zero here, it doesn't matter what this number is because something to the zero power is one. So essentially I can get rid of that. And then the rest of it is my y-intercept is equal to whatever this is times one. Well, it, then you're just saying that my y-intercept is whatever this is. Does that make sense to you? All right, cool. So. If I ask, what's the initial amount of stuff that you started off with? The answer is 500. All right. How much stuff is left after three years? Right. For that, you would go, you would just say, well, what is P of three? Does that make sense? So you just take point, point 0.8. There's no way. See, Lucas, are you saying there's 256,000 grams left after T years? Yeah. 
Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> the reason why Lucas is crazy is because this thing is decaying. So it should the number that you get should be smaller. And I think the reason why, you know, what Lucas was saying is th this number right here, he put in an 8 on accident. So 0.8 to the third power times 500. That's different. Does that make sense? Yeah, it should be smaller because it's decaying. In fact, this number right here is kind of basically saying that every year your amount that you have goes down by 80 or not down it goes down by 20%. Or every year you have 80% of what you had the previous year. Does that make sense? So if this number right here is a number that's bigger than 1, like it's 1 1.5 or 1 1.2 or 1.25 or whatever, then that would t say um, that you're increasing. So you have this exponential increase. So that would be like, what is the population of rats when you leave them inside of a ship and they have unlimited amount of food to, to eat? That would be an exponential increase. See, what's really interesting about this stuff is it doesn't only apply to money, but it applies to like almost everything. The value or the, these, this exponential growth and exponential decay is like probably the biggest thing I can see that relates math to biology. Okay, does this stuff make sense to you? Yeah, the Fibonacci sequence appears everywhere. Well, this is kind of exactly related to the Fibonacci sequence. All right. This part, to be honest with you, I don't know how to tell you to do this one. And the third question is, how much, how many years would it take if you only have 10 grams less left, okay? So what we're saying to do is we're saying, let this thing equal 10. And what I want to do is I want to figure out what T is. To be honest with you, I don't know how to do this problem. It's not that I don't know how to do this problem at all. I know how to do this problem. It takes some mathematics that I'm not ready to teach you about yet. I should probably teach it to you soon. Um, and I think I will be teaching it to you this year. I just don't think I'm ready to teach you this now because it's a little confusing. So it is... I, I, I do hate to say it, but it is trial and error. I'll show you what, what you have to do, okay? What I would do is this. I'd go back to this thing right here. And I would graph it using Desmos. I should call this instead of a Y, I should call it a P, because that's what we use, P. We cool? And Desmos is going to graph it like this. It's going to start at 500 over here. And it's going to exponentially decay as time gets further on and on and on. Are we cool with that? Yeah, yeah, you can use Desmos to find it. All right. What I'm asking here is I'm asking, 
at what time does p equal 10? So over here, it's 500. So what you do is you say, okay, well, if p equals 10, you can look on your graph and you can say, well, what time is that? And then you basically just guess that time. So you say, well, if that's 10, then what is the t value that will give me this value right here? That's what you're looking for. And so you basically take that number and you say, that's my answer. Because in all these questions, I'm saying approximately what is this thing? So what I kind of want you to do is be able to go backwards. What I mean by backwards on the graph is usually on the graph, we give you this answer, then you, you're able to look at the graph and go up and then across and figure out what this answer is. Well, in this case, I'm doing it backwards. I'm saying, if this is 10, what is the t value that gives you that true answer? Are we cool? I could show you a very mathy way to do this, but it involves logarithmic formulas and all of that kind of stuff. And I'm not ready to teach that to you just yet. So my question was with this problem, and I think this is problem number four on one of your homeworks, is, um, is at what time does, uh, do you only have 10 grams left? So you start off with 500 grams of this stuff, okay? And then you wait a certain amount of time. And after one year, you have 80% of that amount of stuff left. After two years, you have 80% of that 80% of the stuff you had left. After three years and so on and so forth. At what point do you only have 10 grams of the stuff if you started off with 500 grams? And like I said, the, the best way for me to show you how to do this is to graph it and then plug in 10 or you don't plug in anything. You just say, you look at 10 and you say, which value of t, this number here, gives me a value of 10. And then what you could do is you could plug in that number that you guessed into this part right here and see how it close it gets you to 10. Do you get it? Does that make sense to you? All right. Let's try this one. Yeah, you can use Desmos. You can use Desmos for all of my homework. Here's a good one. A equals P naught times RT. Now, I changed that from P equals P naught times RT to A. I'm just saying the amount is equal to P naught times RT. Cool? Like I said, I'm going to change the letters on you but it's really the same exact form. Now, this one says, this problem says, this is like number six, I think. It says, suppose that you have a thousand dollars. So your principal amount was a thousand dollars. Got it? And then, um, in seven years, that thing doubles. So if t equals 7, if t equals 7, then a is equal to $2,000. What is your r value? What is your rate? You guys get it? So let's plug in the numbers. It's 2000 is equal to 1,000 times r to the seventh power. What is r? Let's see, do you guys have the math to do that? Let me see if I can figure that out. Um, I want to get r by itself. This is 1,000 times r. So, oh no, it says, the problem says, 
you start off with a thousand dollars. You put it in in, a, in an account for seven years, and it makes it's now two thousand dollars. It doubles. The amount of money you have in the account is two thousand dollars, or it, it just says double. So I'm you know I wrote down two thousand dollars. So what is the interest rate? And so let's see. In order to figure this out, you just make it two is equal to r to the seventh power. You guys understand how I got two? I just took 2,000 divided by 1,000. Two. There we go. And then in order to get rid of this to the seventh power, I just bring it to the one seventh power. Do me a favor. What is two to the one seventh power? I don't have a calculator on me. You're going to have to help me out here. One point one oh four. All right. Then here's my question What was the percent interest on that account? There we go. Very good. About 10%. Because remember, this thing is increasing by 1.104%. That one, the first one, comes from, well, it still has all the money you have in, initially. That's the 100%. So we need to take that off. And you're left with 0.104. But written in percentage-wise, that's... 10.4% because you move the decimal place around. So when you go to the bank, you're going to look for an interest of 10% or maybe, yeah, let's make it, let's make it 10% uh, increase. And then that's about the uh, percent increase that you would need. If you wanted it to double, if you invest some money and you wanted it to double and it occurs interest um, at 10% every year, and you leave it in for seven years, it will double the amount of money you have in there without having to touch it at all. Are we cool? Make sense? All right. You're right, Lucas. It's time for me to go. Um, on Friday, I'll cover, or next week, Monday, I'll cover with you guys this compound interest and E. And this is where we're really getting into some heavy stuff. Cool? But for the most part, let's see, hold on. For the most part, this thing is pretty, yeah. Um, class on Monday is one thirty, like usual. Yeah. For the most part, this stuff is, is pretty much just take what I taught you and apply it. And they might change the letters on you a little bit, but don't freak out. It's they're just they're doing it because they're applying it to different situations. We cool? All right. Talk to you folks later. Okay. But, hey, Bradley, we good? You are currently the only person in this conference. Okay. I guess we're good then. <laughs>